The conservation of Korean mother of pearl has not been well developed nor studied outside of Korea. It is exciting that the exhibition presents the conservation process of four mother of pearl lacquers from the Asian Art Museum collection. So the goals in our conservation process were threefold. First, to perform extensive um, analysis and examination of the objects. Here we wanted to add to the body of knowledge about late Joseon Dynasty Korean lacquerware, because there isn't much out there, and we wanted to help inform our treatment steps. To this end, we started out by analyzing each piece visually. So the objects in our uh, study here involved lacquer, ray skin, mother pearl, tortoise shell, metal wires, and metal flakes on each object. This table has a number of large cracks running through it, which are going to give us the opportunity to take some nice samples. With a cross-section sample, we can prepare it and put it under the microscope and see the different layers of the surface. We're examining the cross-section. We want to be able to distinguish between original material and anything that was added after the object was made. The bulk of this cross-section is the ground layer that's been bulked with crushed animal bone, crushed fired ceramic, and those are the larger particles within the dark black layer. On top of that is a thin lacquer layer. It's slightly brown and has golden flecks in it. The thick yellow layer appears to be original and I think was probably put on there to keep the wires shiny. The layer over that is some later coating. We wouldn't mind removing that layer coating, especially if it's interfering with the look of the object now. But before we removed anything, we'd have to think very carefully about why it's there, what it's doing to, uh, to the appearance of the object, because you want the object to look as much like it did originally as possible. In addition to looking at the object under normal light, we always look at them under ultraviolet radiation. Examining objects under UV often helps us to identify materials that aren't visible in normal light. If this were just lacquer, we wouldn't expect any of this fluorescence. There are lots of different materials on this. Of course, the mother of pearl is fluorescing different colors. This ray skin that has been dyed also forms different colors. So this swath of light green is unexpected. It is a different coating from the rest of the surface. This means possibly a repair campaign along this crack. Now that we've looked at this table with visible light, UV light, and under the microscope, we're interested to see more details about how it was constructed. And for that, we're going to use x-rays. Furniture is frequently broken and repaired. So we might very well find evidence of that with the x-rays. This one's a modern style box nail. This is a modern style finishing nail. And there's no reason to be mixing and matching your kinds of nails. Mm -hmm. Most likely the finishing nails were used for later repairs. We can see most of the nails are coming from the top down, but then this nail was put in from the bottom up and it's probably a repair. This nail also is coming in from the end and probably is not original. All these details will help us to decide what's original, what it probably looked like originally, and uh, help us decide what to remove, what to leave alone. This is the X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, or XRF. We use it to identify the elements in the object. The XRF produces a tiny X-ray beam, which is projected into the object, and when it encounters the electrons around all the atoms, those electrons release a little bits of energy which the XRF can detect and count. Here we're looking at this squiggly wire on the screen because we're interested to know whether it's gold, which it looks like, or whether it's maybe gilded brass, copper, bronze, whatever. It takes about a minute. So once the machine's done running and we've got a spectrum, we need to identify all the peaks. And that's a matter of calling up our periodic table and identifying things. It's not gold wire, it's copper and zinc. There is some gold involved here, it looks like. Possibly that wire might have a fine gold plating on it, and that pretty much covers it. So the second goal was to stabilize 
the objects. So there was quite a lot of lifting inlay material, so lifting lacquer, lifting wire, lifting mother of pearl, lifting ray skin. The idea being that once those are secured, the object can be exhibited safely and stored safely without further risk of loss. And the final goal was to make aesthetic compensations for losses in the inlay materials and the lacquer. We wanted the overall pattern to be legible again and not distracting at all to the viewer. In general, in conservation, when we're making replacement parts, we like to make them reversible because it could well be that in the future someone will come up with a better answer. The other thing that we want to make sure of is that the, uh, the materials that we use for replacement parts are readily identifiable as such. And while they should not be obvious from any distance, close up, if you know what you're looking for, you should be able to tell which parts are original and which parts are replacements. So that um, scholars in the future, for example, won't be fooled by our work and take it to be original. The treatments of the four objects were actually fairly similar. For several of the inlay materials, we had to come up with creative fills. So for example, the horn, I used a thick mylar, painted the underside with acrylic, then dulled the sheen of the mylar with a micromesh sandpaper. So I'm not using an original horn material, but something that looks very much like it. Then another recently developed technique by conservators at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston was to create fills for lacquer using cast pieces of acrylic film. We're using acrylic paint matched to the color of the loss. And we can cast it out onto silicon release mylar. Then once it dries, you get this nice flexible piece that you can then cut to the shape of your loss, place it in there, and then you have a removable fill. There were pre-existing fills around some of the top surface of the uh, round table, but they were lacking the small golden flakes that the rest of the surface has. So we put a little adhesive on each of those areas, and then we're using a piece of bamboo tube with a very fine net put over the end to disperse very fine golden mica powder onto the adhesive so to make a, a match with the original. So the most challenging um, aspect of the process was to create a film material for the ray skin losses. And this was a big problem because each area of loss had different scale size subtle differences in color plus a texture, and it was incredibly thin. So what to put in place here? We first decided that using more ray skin was probably not a good idea because of its lack of availability, but also because you don't want to use a material which can be mistaken for the original. We started thinking that we could take a photocopy of the object and then making a color print, cut out bits of the photocopy to make the fills. But we found out that it was almost impossible to get the color match right. Then of course the ray skin is not just a flat blank color, you've got these circles which represent the knobs on the surface of the skin. When we thought about that, we realized that the best way to reproduce that texture was to use some kind of a circular punch to press circles into the paper. We tried all kinds of things and we couldn't find something that was the right size and shape until we remembered that in the closet we had some very old glass syringes and needles from oh, 40, 50 years ago. And we hauled one of those out and found that we have a complete set of tips, all different sizes, and they're made of stainless steel. So they're the perfect tool to impress these little dots on the paper. It's a good thing we saved them for these 50 years, isn't it? I ended up using the metal syringe tips with different diameter to create the circular scales. Outlining those with a pen, then adding some gloss, adhering this in place, and then burnishing it further to enhance the gloss. It's pretty common in conservation that we find tools from other areas that we use. Not a lot of tools are made specifically for conservation, and you have these needs for some odd little thing that you just have to fish around and find the right object to do the job. The other technique that was 
slightly unusual was to use the wax resin to fill hairline cracks in the lacquer losses. Wax resin fills are typically used in paintings conservation, so to use them here in an object is slightly different, but a good choice for filling this very tiny crack. So I first put down a barrier layer of a conservation grade adhesive, and then I have mixed up a custom color of the wax resin, and I have my heated spatula, and then I will apply it to this crack. In order to replace the lost wire, we purchased new wire from the hardware store, and then I bent it to match the shape, and then adhered it in place, and then had to tone it so that it didn't look like new wire. Okay, on the 12-sided table, one leg was missing a foot, so I took a mold of um, an existing foot, then cast a new foot, carved it down to fit exactly, and then adhered it in place and painted it to match. This tray was the most damaged of the four objects that we treated. In fact, there was a great deal of damage, especially on the outside, and we decided not to completely uh, repair that. We've stabilized it, but we left it in a condition that you can see how the object is made. There's a wooden base, and that's covered with the textile layer, and on top of that is a ground layer and a finished layer of lacquer, and then set into the lacquer are the inlays, such as the ray skin and the brass wires. We did go ahead and finish up the inside much more neatly so that we can exhibit it like this and you won't see the damaged parts. And then uh, once all the replacement parts were put on, it was mainly a matter of toning all those replacement bits so that they matched visually, and then bringing up the gloss, doing a little bit of polishing, buffing, cleaning, to get them to look as good as they could. The round table had a coating of beeswax applied to it, and over the years it started trapping dirt and dust into the wax. So I used a bristle brush to clean out where the surface of the table met the wires, and then used Kim wipes and a chamois cloth to buff the surface of the table. It's always rewarding when you're finished with the treatment to step back and see how much better the piece looks afterwards than before. But in fact, I really enjoy the analysis. I like looking at the objects and examining them closely to figure out what they're made of and how they're made. That somehow gives me the feeling that I have some kind of view into the eye and the mind of the craftsman who made it originally. There are still contemporary artisans working in Korea who use the, um, the traditional methods of mother of pearl decoration. This tradition serves to reflect Korean artisans' effort to reach perfection, and this aspect is carried on today in Korea.